Let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we ask that you bless us now as we consider the scriptures and this difficult passage. We ask that you would help us to follow it and to get a better understanding of your ways of speaking to us so that we can understand Revelation better. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. As you can see from your notes, we're in Zechariah's night visions today. And I hope we can survey this in one hour because I'm going to be gone next week. So it would be nice to get this finished up and we can get back into Revelation. But Zechariah chapters 1 through 6 is what we want to survey. So let's do it. We need to do this because chapter 11 of Revelation says this, I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the land. We need to understand something in the way of background before we can really come to grips with this very well. Also, we're going to find in a few chapters a woman riding on the back of the dragon, and we need to see where this comes from. Now, we could just pop back into Zechariah each time we have a reference, and we will do that, of course. But at some point, it's a good idea to get the whole picture of what's going on in this section of Zechariah before us. And so that's what I want to try to do today. And you have on page 94 an overview of what happens here. The night visions take place in the night. And they start with sunset, and they go to midnight, and they move through to sunrise. There are eight of these visions, and the eight visions are, as you can see, structured chiastically. And so, let's read them. The first vision is in Zechariah 1, 7 to 17. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month Shebat, in the second year of Darius, the word of Yahweh came to Zechariah the prophet, son of Berechiah, and son of Iddo, as follows. This is what Zechariah sees. I saw at night, and behold, a man was riding on a red horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees, or hadassah trees, which were in a ravine with red sorrel and white horses behind him. Then I said, My master, what are these? And the angel who was speaking with me said to me, I'll show you what these are. This is the angelic interpreter, and of course we have the angelic interpreter in Revelation as well. And so the angel is going to show him what these horses among the myrtle trees are. And the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are those whom Yahweh has sent to patrol the earth. So they answered the angel of Yahweh who was standing among the myrtle trees, now we know who this is, and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth is peaceful and quiet. Then the angel of Yahweh answered and said, O Yahweh of hosts, he speaks to the Father here, how long wilt thou have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, with which thou hast been indignant these seventy years? And the angel of Yahweh answered the angel who was speaking with me with gracious words, comforting words. So the angel who was speaking with me said to me, Proclaim, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, but I am very angry with the nations who are at ease, for while I was only a little angry, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it, declares Yahweh of hosts, and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. Again proclaim, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, My cities will again overflow with prosperity, and Yahweh will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. Just briefly, let's consider this. We have this vision down in a ravine, in a place that's low, not high. And high and low in the Bible, high places are close to God. They're mountaintops, they're altars, they're pillars, they're upper rooms, they're rooftops. This is the opposite of that. What is seen is church in a low condition. And it's among myrtle trees. Now, the myrtle grove here should remind us probably of what? What pops into your mind when you think about that or when you envision it? Yeah, with myrtle fruit. No, that wouldn't quite be an orchard, but it would be a grove of trees. The Garden of Eden, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got kind of, you know, the Garden of Eden scene here. 
And these particular are myrtle trees, not just any other trees. Now, this is a real, I mean, this is at the Ph.D. level here, but does anybody have any idea why they're myrtle trees and not cedar trees or cypress trees or terebinth trees? Abraham pitched his tent under terebinth trees. The tabernacle was made of acacia wood. The temple was made of cedar. Now we come to myrtles. Jesus' ministry was conducted around olives. So at each covenant in history, there's a different tree that comes to the fore. What do myrtles link up with? This is a toughie. Well, there is a whole book of the Bible about a girl named Myrtle. In Hebrew, Hadassah. In Persian, Esther. And there are numerous references to Esther in Zechariah, but I think that Esther being a type of the church links in with the myrtle trees here. This is a picture of the church at this stage in history. The church is not terebinth trees. The church is not acacia trees. The church is not cedar trees. At this stage in history, the church is myrtle trees. That's the grove, the garden. And among these myrtle trees were these different colored horses. And we found different colored horses in Revelation as well. But the horses have been going around looking at the world. And they come back and they say, nothing's going on. The world is at ease. Now, these horses are red and sorrel and white. They are rainbow colors, which means they express the covenant of God. And this series of colors always pick up the rainbow motif but particularly red and white. These colors would also associate with sunset. I think that's correct. Most expositors see it that way. The sun is going down. The horses are the sunset colors. And they represent, of course, the host of Yahweh of hosts. Yahweh of hosts is a character in this drama. The captain of these horses is the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, Jesus. And this is the host of God the Father, Yahweh of hosts. Now Yahweh of hosts is also used for Jesus. God is three persons and one person. The name of the three persons are the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Father, the Brother, and the Counselor. Father, the Husband, and the Matchmaker. That's the name of the three persons. What is the name of the one God? It's Yahweh or Jehovah. And that's used for each of the three persons at different times. In this passage... Yahweh of hosts is primarily used for God the Father, and the angel of Yahweh refers to God the Son. Well, the God the Son, angel of Yahweh, is in charge of this army. And the army has roamed around the world and says nothing's going on. And this army is the host of Yahweh of hosts. Now, are they angels or people? Good question. I think at this point they're probably angels. But these colored horses, the host of Yahweh of hosts, is going to be men in just a few minutes. Nothing's going on in the world, and that's not good. For the earth to be peaceful and quiet means that salvation hasn't gone out to the world. The witness has not taken place. Jerusalem has no influence. Jerusalem is down in a valley. The rivers flow out of valleys. Well, only if they're going straight to the ocean. We want Jerusalem to be in a high place so that the rivers flow out to the world. But right now, there's no rivers flowing out to the world because Jerusalem is in a low place. There's no salvation. And that has to change, and it's going to change during the night. It's sunset, and when we get to midnight, we're going to have Passover. Of course, that's what happens at midnight. And Passover, the sins will be forgiven. And at the end, when the sun is coming up, now Jerusalem will be a high mountain. And now the horses will ride out. So let's look at that. Let's just look at the matching vision in chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Zechariah 6, 1 through 8. This is the matching vision. Now, this is the sunrise vision. The sun is coming up. Things have changed during the night. Now I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from between the two mountains, and the mountains were bronze mountains. And the first chariot were red horses, the second chariot black horses, the third chariot white horses, and the fourth chariot strong 
dappled horses. Then I spoke to the angel who was speaking to me and said, What are these, my master? And the angel answered and said to me, These are the four winds of heaven going forth after standing before the master of all the earth, with one of which the black horses are going forth to the north country, and the white ones go after them, and the dappled ones go forth to the south country. And when the strong ones, the strong dappled horses, went out, they were eager to go and patrol the earth. And he said, Go, patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Then he cried out to me and spoke to me, saying, See, those who have gone to the land of the north have appeased my wrath in the land of the north. Or literally, they have caused my spirit to rest in the land of the north. Well, now, the horses are not just roaming around like spies patrolling the earth and investigating things. Now they are linked up with war chariots and they're riding out between the bronze mountains and conquering the world. Now who are they? It says in verse 5 that they are the four winds of heaven. And who are the four winds of heaven? They're the saints. Because in Zechariah 2, we've been told this, Chapter 2, verse 6. Of course, we didn't read that yet. We're jumping to the end. But chapter 2, verse 6, the Lord says, I have spread you out as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. So the four winds of heaven are the saints, and they are these four chariots riding out. So now the horses are clearly the church, and they're riding out to conquer the world as the sun comes up. Now, that's an old idea, conquering as the sun comes up. There's nothing new about that. Remember that after Jacob wrestled with the angel, it says that he went across the four Jabbok, limping as he went, and the sun rose behind him. Remember that Deborah prays in Judges 5, let all of your people be like the sun rising in its might. Remember that as Gideon came back from his battle and crossed the river, the sun was coming up behind him. Remember that the last judge in the book of Judges is named Sunrise, Shamshon, Samson, Sunrise. Psalm 19 says that the Lord is like the sun in a mighty bridegroom and a sun in a tabernacle. And so, the sunrise idea in the Bible is always a picture of strength and power going out. The sun banishes the night. And here it is. The chariots are riding out. The church is going forth in her witness to the world and no longer coming forth from some valley, but coming out from two bronze mountains. Now, what are the two bronze mountains? And where are these chariots riding out from? This is another Ph.D. level question. This is a toughie. If you get it, you get a gold star. Okay, well, I'll show you. This is the temple. This is the throne of God here in the Holy of Holies. And that is also called the chariot. In fact, we saw that chariot in Ezekiel, the big chariot. Now, out here, in front of the temple, is the bronze ocean and the altar. And there are also, you can read about these in 1 Kings 7, ten chariots of water positioned in two streams running from the temple out to the altar. And these things, they've got a big bowl full of water in them, and that sets inside a big... I mean, you can't move these things. They're just symbols. A very large four cubit by four cubit square holder that has a lion and an ox, king and priest, facing out at you, and two big wheels on each side, and also to hold the thing up, big strong feet here, and that's you know, on each side of this thing, I don't know how to draw this, but there you are, and there are ten of these lined up, 
making a river that flows from the throne of God down to the altar. These chariots are flowing out from the temple. They're flowing out from the throne of God. They're bringing the rain of heaven. See, this water is up above the ground. It's heavenly water. It's water above the firmament. This container here represents the firmament, and the waters above it are the waters above the firmament. Same here with the bronze ocean. You have the bronze ocean here, which is huge, and it sits on the back of these 12 bulls that face out this way. Represent Israel and the firmament and the waters above the firmament. Well, here is this water running down from the temple. And that is the outflow of these chariots. This is in the days of King Solomon. Now, this is an expansion on that picture, but to understand this picture in Zechariah, we've got to understand the earlier picture. God's ten chariots of water run out from his throne to purify the altar and the priests and to provide grace to Israel. And they come out from between two bronze mountains. You know what the two bronze mountains are? There's one bronze mountain here and one bronze mountain here. This bronze mountain is called Yachin. And this bronze mountain is called Boaz. They are the two pillars that stand in front of the temple. The king pillar, Boaz, that's David's family name. And the priest pillar, Yachin. The king was ordained by the king's pillar, and the priests were ordained by the priest pillar. And these two pillars are two gigantic bronze lilies. What's what they looked like? They had a little collar here, and then they had kind of a lily top above. But they are also bronze mountains. And so the outflow from God's throne comes between the mountains, and that is what's picked up here. That's what's alluded to here. These chariots are coming out from standing before the master of the earth. So the chariots have gone into the temple. This is all visionary now. They've gone into the temple. They've received their marching orders from the master of the earth. And now they're coming out, and they're coming out between the priest and the king pillar, Yachin and Boaz, and they're going to the world. This is the first and the last vision here. The first vision, we got these horses. They've been patrolling the earth. They're probably just angels at this point because people haven't been restored yet. But now here at the end, the horses are moving out. They've been standing before the Lord of the whole earth. They move out and they take the gospel, the conquest, to the world as the four winds of heaven. And these are the saints. By the way, these horses show up again right at the end of Zechariah where it says in chapter 14, verse 20, in that they will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to Yahweh. So what is written on the high priest's golden plate, forehead, crown, is now put on the bells of all these horses that represent the church riding out. Now, they've come from standing before the Lord of the whole earth and that we will see in Zechariah's visions. We will see Joshua the high priest standing before the Lord of the whole earth, covered with sin and ready to be destroyed. But then God forgives his sin. And then we will see Zerubbabel, the king, standing before the Lord of the whole earth and filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what happens at midnight. And that's what enables them to ride forth. What has to happen? At the beginning of these visions, as the sun goes down, we can't ride out. We're in this low estate. Why is that? It's because of sin. Before the visions even start, God says this in chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 and following. Yahweh was angry with your fathers, therefore say to them, the people, Zacharias to say to the people, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, return to me, declares Yahweh of hosts, that I may return to you, says Yahweh of hosts. This is very encouraging. I mean, they shouldn't be afraid to come back to God because in spite of all the armies that are around, Yahweh of hosts is the one with the real army. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, return now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they didn't listen or give heed to me, declares Yahweh. Your fathers, where are they? 
they're gone. They've been punished. And the prophets, do they live forever? Did not my words and my statutes, which I commanded to my servants, the prophets, overtake your fathers? So he tells them they need to repent and get their sins forgiven. But how can they do it? Well, God has to forgive their sins, and that's what happens during the night. And at the end of it, then we can ride forth. So that's a progression here. We have to have a Passover during the night. What happened as the sun came up after the first Passover? The very first Passover. What happened as the sun came up? Yeah, they booked it out of Egypt. They all marched out. There was an outflow. And that was at that stage in history. Now we move to another stage in history. This time we're not just leaving Egypt. No, no, the idea is much more powerful. We ride forth to conquer the world. And in Revelation, we'll see the same thing. After Jerusalem is destroyed, Jesus comes on his white horse with the armies behind him to conquer the world. So this transition is the same. Now let's look at the second vision here. Zechariah chapter 1. Too bad the chapter divisions don't go with the visions, but they don't. So the second vision, the sun is now set and it's gotten dark. It's getting dark now. And we're moving in toward midnight. This is at 8.30 at night now. The second vision comes. And it's Zechariah chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, four horns. And I said to the angel who was speaking with me, What are these? It's kind of nice to have an angel along with you to help you out. Remember, Joseph was there to help out Pharaoh, and Daniel was there to help out Nebuchadnezzar, and these angels are here to help out Zechariah. What are these? And he answered and said to me, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then Yahweh showed me four craftsmen, four workers, four carpenters, four builders. And I said, What are these coming to do? And he said, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, so that no man lifts up his head. But these... These builders have come to terrify them, to cast down the horns of the nations who have lifted up horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter it. Now, there are two ways to read this, a true way and a false way, I think. Usually, the interpretation is that the four horns represent the powers of the world which have come in and conquered Israel and taken the Jews into exile. And somehow or other, these four carpenters represent faithful Israel, which will destroy the nations that have come against them. But there's a better interpretation in that, and I hope you'll see it when I explain it to you. The horns here are the horns of the altar. Remember that an altar looks like this, essentially. And the altars have horns on them, on the corners. Since the altar represents a holy mountain, the horns represent mountain peaks. That's one thing. Second of all, since the altar represents the human body, the horns represent the horns on the human body, which are anointed with oil. When you do a sacrifice, you put oil, excuse me, you put blood on these horns when you do your sacrifice. You smear blood on each of the four horns. When Aaron is anointed or when the leper is cleansed, blood is put on three of the horns of his body, his right earlobe, his right thumb, and his right big toe. The fourth horn was made bloody at circumcision. So those are the four horns of the body which are bloodied. The human body is an altar. The altar is also a mountain. It's a multivalent symbol. What has happened? Well, what this passage means is the four horns that scattered Israel and Jerusalem, which came from the nations, represent false worship. And a good illustration of it is the altar of Damascus that was set up to replace the Lord's altar. They actually brought in foreign altars to put in and worship with foreign horns. But more generally, the four wicked horns represent false worship. Not political powers now, but false worship, because one worships through the horns of the altar. Now he says, 
He sees four builders, and the builders are coming to tear down the old horns, the false worship, and obviously to repair true worship. Now, what's that mean? You have to understand exactly what's going on at this time. And what's going on right now, while Zechariah is asleep, well, everybody else is asleep, but what was going on during the day is that the Jews are building the temple. They are rebuilding the temple. For about 20 years, the Jews didn't do anything about rebuilding the temple after they came back from exile. They came back from exile, they kind of got it going a little bit, and then they stopped because there was some opposition. Then in the days of Darius, they were told to start building the temple and the altar again, and Haggai and Zechariah prophesied to them and said, God is not blessing you because you haven't gotten this temple built. You're not worshiping right, so you're not being blessed. Well, they started doing it. And after they started doing it and started building the temple, Zechariah is given this vision. He says, now, now that you've started building again, things are going to change. Things are going to change. Up till now, you've had no influence and witness. You've been in a valley. But as you get this temple built, things are going to change, and you're going to have this outflow of power from the horses going out. And what are the things that are changing? Well, one of them is that the carpenters and craftsmen of Israel, the four craftsmen or four builders, are tearing down the false worship, and they're building the temple, and they're building an altar. So that is the meaning of this second vision. Now let's match that with the seventh vision, which is in chapter 5. If you're lost, it's because you are not following along in the Bible. Chapter 5, verses 5 to 11, talks about true and false temples. This is on the other side of midnight, and here we see false worship driven out as true worship is established. False temple is set up away from the true temple. Zechariah 5, verses 5 to 11. This is the temple vision that matches the altar vision we just looked at. Then the angel who was speaking with me went out and said to me, Lift up now your eyes and see what this is going forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is the ephah going forth. Ephah is a big bushel basket. Again, he said, this is what they look like in all the land. That doesn't help much, does it? Behold, a lead cover was lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. Then he said, this is wickedness. And he cast her down into the middle of the ephah and put the lead weight on its top, on its mouth. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and there were two women coming out with the wind in their wings, and they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heavens. And I said to the angel who was speaking to me, Where are they taking the ephah? And he said, To build a house for her in the land of Shinar, and when it is prepared, she will be set there on her own pedestal. Now that's either clear as day or as clear as mud. And whether it's clear as day or clear as mud depends on whether you see what this is. Does anybody know what this Ephra and storks and house in Shinar and all that is? It's a counterfeit Ark of the Covenant. The Ark is square. This is round. The Ark has two cherubim on either side of it. This has two storks on either side of it. The Ark has what inside of it? What is inside the Ark? The law. Righteousness, what's inside this ephah? Wickedness, the bad chick, the bad woman of wickedness. The ark has a gold cover on it called a mercy seat. What does this have on it? It has a lead cover on it. The ark is enthroned in the temple and sits on its stand. What's happening to the ephah here? It's going to be put in a temple too. The ark is in a temple in Jerusalem. Where is this Ephah in a temple? In Shinar, which is also Babylon. It's where the Tower of Babel was built. Now, does this woman show up again in the Bible? Yes, yeah, she shows up in Revelation. This is the woman in Revelation. Babylon. 
She's gotten out of the ephah. Now, how did she get out of that ephah? Why did she get out? Well, the reason is, here's the ark, and here's the cherubim. What's inside of this ark is the mystery. It's a mystery because it's locked up. But in the New Testament, the ark is opened and the mystery is published. The mystery is the Word of God. Actually, it has three dimensions. It's Aaron's rod, the blossoms, the sacraments of manna, and the law of God. But it's primarily the completed truth of God that's published out. Well, at the same time, the mystery of what? Mystery of lawlessness. The mystery of wickedness is also published and opened out at the same time. Why? So that this one can destroy this one. But they're parallel. The publication of the mystery of the kingdom and the revelation of the mystery of wickedness happen at the same time for the same reason. And these are two parallel arcs, a true arc and an anti-arc, the evil twin. Now, did the wicked in Israel literally go over to Babylon and build a temple? No. Of course not. Physically and geographically, this ephah with the storks and the house in Shinar, physically and geographically, where is this located? It's located in Jerusalem. At exactly the same place as the temple. Have you ever seen this show on TV? Tales from the... Not Tales from the Crypt. It's... Uh, Tales from the dark side. And it starts off and it says, next to our world where we live, there's a shadow world. And they have a picture of a meadow in full color. And then they put a filter on it and it kind of changes into a kind of a negative black and white picture of the same scene. I turn it off too. Those are poorly acted, crummy stories for the most part. But we've seen the, maybe you've seen the beginning of it, you know, before you had a chance to turn the show off. That is what this is. There's sort of a negative, counterfeit, bad temple superimposed on the true one. And what Jesus does when he comes is he calls all the saints out of this and what's left behind is only the counterfeit. And that's why in the book of Revelation, the temple in Jerusalem, all that's left behind is the counterfeit, the apostate Jews and the Judaizers. But until Jesus and the apostles come and harvest out the true temple from the false, they're right there superimposed on each other. But the revelation here is that as they build the true altar of God and restore worship, there is in some sense a separation, spiritual and moral, if not geographical, that takes place between the true and the false temples of God. So that in Israel, after Zechariah, in the days of Jesus, there were those who went to the temple and were righteous like the publican. And there were others who went to the temple and were wicked, like the Pharisee, in the story of the Pharisee and the publican. And so that separation between those who are the poor in spirit, who grieve over the sins on the one hand, and those who are oppressors on the other, that separation at the moral and spiritual level is taking place. And it takes place at the ecclesiastical level in the first century as the true saints are culled out of Israel and Israel is destroyed. So we've looked at the second and the seventh visions, the altars true and false. Now we can look at the third vision, which is in chapter 2. And I can see that we're not going to get done with this, but we're just going to have to do it. You need to get this package somewhere in your subconscious before you can really do as much with Revelation as we want. Chapter 2 of Zechariah. Then I lifted up my eyes. So now this is what, when is this? This is, we're getting on toward about 1030 at night now. He's dozed off again, and now he's got some more rapid eye movement sleep going on. And in his REM sleep, he has a third dream. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. And I said, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see how wide it is and how long it is. Now, the people who heard this vision had already read Ezekiel. And remember that in Ezekiel, at the end of Ezekiel, 
we have this man with a measuring line, and he goes and he measures everything. And we're given the size of the city, and we're given the size of each of the compartments of the land, and the allotment of the prince, and we're told the size of the temple, and the inner wall, and the outer wall, and the size of the gates. Everything is measured out. Now, this is a complementary vision here that says you can't measure it. You've got to take both of those together to get the symbolism complete. The man is going out to measure Jerusalem to see how wide it is and how long it is. In other words, how square it is. Behold, the angel who was speaking with me was going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him, and he said, Run, tell that young man, saying, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls. Because of the multitude of men and cattle within it, because I, declares Yahweh, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be her glory in her midst. So now he's saying there won't be a wall, that the Lord himself will be a wall of fire around Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will be so big that they won't be able to measure it. Now, Nehemiah came back and built this wall, which made it into a holy city. Jerusalem was not called the holy city in David's day or during the kings. It becomes a holy city after the exile when the holy wall is built. And Nehemiah is not about national defense first and foremost. The building of that wall is part of the new covenant and the greater boundary of the city. Well, now he says we don't need a wall. We can't measure it. God is going to be a wall of fire. Well, both of those things are true, you see. At one level, we can measure this building that's being built. Nehemiah will build a wall. At another level, Jerusalem is too big, and God will be a wall of fire around Jerusalem. Now, when you look at those two things, you have to begin to ask yourself a question. Is there a spiritual Jerusalem that's being spoken of here that can't be measured with walls? Obviously, this whole thing is talking about spiritual phenomena and not physical ones. It's not even using very much in the way of physical symbols. Well, let's read further, and we'll see that it is. Chapter 2, verse 6. Ho there! Flee from the land of the north, declares Yahweh, because I have spread you out as the four winds of the heavens, declares Yahweh. Ho Zion! Escape you who are living with daughter Babylon! For thus says Yahweh of hosts, After glory he has sent me against the nations to plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Behold, I will wave my hand over them so that they will be plundered for their slaves, and they will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me. Sing for joy and be glad, daughter Zion. For behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, declares Yahweh. Many nations will join themselves to Yahweh in that day and will become my people. Then I will dwell in your midst and you will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. And Yahweh will possess Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent all flesh before Yahweh, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. Whoa. Now, I want you to tell me when this happened. The nations are going to plunder, try to plunder Israel. But those who touch Israel touch the apple of his eye. And God will wave his hand over them. And the nations will become plunder for those they sought to enslave. Who were the Jews? The Jews will plunder them. And that will be a sign that the Lord of hosts has sent the angel of the Lord to Jerusalem. And many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day, and many will become my people. What's that a prophecy concerning? Esther. The book of Esther fulfills this prophecy. You'll remember in Esther, of course, that the attempt was for those of all the nations to try to plunder the Jews. The Jews wound up plundering them, and many people became Jews in that day. You read Esther chapter 9, this is all described. And it was a sign to them to know that the Lord was on their side because they had repented. But these Jews who were attempting to be plundered, were they all located in Jerusalem? No, they were all over the world. And so I think we have to see that Jerusalem here is spiritual Jerusalem. Moreover, if we were to take them, let's look at verse 6. Ho there, flee from the land of the north, because I have spread you out as the four winds of the heavens. Well, wait a minute. Are they supposed to flee from the land of the north and come back to Jerusalem? 
Or are they being spread out all over the world? Looks well, almost like a contradiction. We have to see that it is a spiritual departure that's being spoken of. Reject the sinful ways and return to the Lord. But you will be spread out all over the world as witnesses. Then he says in verse 7, Escape you who are living with daughter Babylon. Now there's a reason why that's a problem. Is Babylon the empire at this point? No, we're in the Persian Empire. Babylon's been destroyed for 20, 25 years. So what does it mean, leave Babylon? Well, again, it has to be speaking in symbolic spiritual categories. Leave behind the old ways, leave behind your sins, and come into spiritual Jerusalem. And spiritual Jerusalem doesn't have a wall. If you're living in Susa, you don't have a wall around you that's the wall of Jerusalem. But God will be a wall of fire around you. He's prophesying that when he removes their sins, he will be with them wherever they go. His glory will be with them. And he will protect them wherever they go. And they will be spread out all over the world as witnesses. At that point, I think we have to stop. I'm going to check off what we did. Now look, I know... This is not an easy passage of the Bible. But you have this, and you have this. Zechariah chapters 1 through 6 takes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 pages. Actually, about 4 pages of type. Those 4 pages of type, you can read and read with this chart until you get more familiar with all the stuff that's in here. Because we've got to get this stuff inside of us before we can really move further in Revelation. John assumes you know this. Well, Jesus assumes you know it because Jesus wrote Revelation. And we need to get as much of it as we can under our belt. So your assignment for the next two weeks is to read Zechariah several times with this chart. When we come back, we can finish this and see what happens at midnight. And the sins are taken away, and the Spirit is poured out. Forty-nine pipes of oil are poured out so the temple can be built. That's the outpouring of the Spirit. Removing of sin, outpouring of the Spirit, that happens at midnight. And everything flows out from there. And you might just think about whether this looks like the seven days of creation. And you might just think about whether this whole sequence of events bears any resemblance to the sequence of events in Revelation itself. You can think about those things if you want, but mainly your assignment. And you will have a quiz when I get back. No, you won't. But if you want to get anything out of our study, you're going to have to spend a little time on your own reading the passage and using this as your guide. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the scriptures and for the amazing richness of them. We are aware today just how little we know and how hard it is for us to understand some of these things just because we don't have the information in our minds. But you want us to know it. It's too bad we didn't learn all these things when we were children, but we didn't. And so now we're trying to learn them. We ask that you bless us as we consider these things and help us to become more and more at home in this language so that we can understand the world your way and understand the Scriptures better. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.